Hey, how's it going? You want to continue to enjoy this free award-winning content? That's right, we won an award. Chapter of the month, ATV CFL of Golf. Check out the links in the description. You can see more details about it. In any event, we're going to go offline by the end of this year, 2019, if we don't get a thousand subscribers. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you tell your friends, make sure the friends tell our friends. We gotta get a thousand subscribers, guys. We gotta keep this going so we can provide the best free content out there with personalities from both academia and workplace learning. So make sure you subscribe, click notifications. We'll see you on the next one. Welcome back to another ATD CFL epic episode of <laughs> Off the Cuff. Uh, and it is epic because you, I mean, if you know anything about instructional design and you study anything about multimedia learning, then you're seeing a legend to my right, uh, stage left, whatever you want to call it. And uh, it's been, a, it, it, this one is going to be super special. So make sure that you check the links in the in the description because we're going to put a lot of links in there. And we're talking today, or at least I have the honor and privilege to talk to, uh, I think, uh, you know, you can correct me, sir, but a world record, most prolific researcher there is in the world. I mean, <laughs> over 500 or so publications and ongoing. Uh, distinguished professor at the University of South California, is it? University of California, Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, that's what it is. University of California, Santa Barbara. I mean, uh, and, and I dare I say, you know, you created the multimedia learning theory, right? Oh, thank you. Okay, so <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> this is Dr. Richard Mayer. Dr. Mayer, uh, may I call you Richard? Please. Yes, sir. Sir, welcome to ATDCFLs Off the Cup. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward <laughs> to talking with you. Uh, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on right now in California. Are you guys, you safe or you're not in the area where the fires are and all that? It's not. Oh no, we're we're smelling we're smelling smoke right now. Wow, well, prayer is going your way. Hope everything is fine because we don't need we don't need uh, that institution to have any issues for sure. Um, and we want you to be safe. So. Let's uh, break it down, sir, because I, as, as you know, I, uh, I'm doing this uh, blog and it's uh, primarily targeted towards um, workplace learning. And uh, it, it is a profession or field that has gone to many permutations and it changes every year based on the, the whims of, you know, um, the winds of time, I guess. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it went from training and development to uh, learning and development and Workplace learning is another term for that, but essentially what we're talking about, if I was going to put it in, uh, in jargon, is uh, focus on adult education for work performance, mm -hmm. I would say, right? So based on that, um, can you share a little bit to us about what was the purpose and why, why were you so passionate about um, studying where technology and learning uh, converge and how to really enhance that. Yeah, you know, I've always basically been interested in how people learn, trying to understand how that works, and also uh, how to help people learn. So you could call that the science of learning and the science of instruction. I wanna <laughs> know how do people learn? How can we help people learn? Right. And in particular, how can you help people learn so they can use what they've learned in new situations? Because, I mean, we want people to be able to transfer what they've learned in what, whatever situation they get themselves into. I um, want them to have transferable knowledge. So, I mean, that's a very classic issue in both psychology and education. How do you, how do you teach for transfer? It's, that was like one of the original questions in both fields. So. That question has been around for over a hundred years, yep. but I solved it. Don't worry. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So the, uh, the theory of multimedia learning, multimedia, tell me about that. Uh, what, what is involved? What are the components in that and in your words? Okay. So 
I kind of got interested in um, techniques we can use to enhance learning. And um, since a lot of instruction and training is delivered with technology, I kind of, that kind of is why I got interested in technology. I'm not really interested in technology per se, because I don't, I don't think technology teaches us. Computer, we, don't, we don't learn because it's on a computer. We learn because there's an effective instructional method that's being implemented on the computer. Okay. So this kind of theory of multimedia learning, um, I kind of got into that with the idea that, I mean, the way I was trained as a experimental psychologist, we focus mostly on verbal learning and I think that's what psychologists and educators mostly focus on is using words for teaching. So most instruction is word-based, either in books or in face-to-face -face, um, classrooms. We use words. But I also think graphics can really enhance the learning experience. So my real question is, um, does adding graphics to words help people learn better? And if so, how, do, how should we integrate the graphics and the words to maximize understanding. Because uh, I do think graphics are fundamentally different than words and they can help you understand things that it's harder to understand with just words. Right. So, so that's really all I mean by multimedia learning. I just mean learning from words and graphics. And by graphics, I mean you know, fo you know, still, still graphics like photos or illustrations and dynamic graphics like video or animation. Any, anything that's a graphic. And by words, I just mean speech or printed text. Right. So these are the elements we have, and, and I've been interested in how you can put them together. And I've had the luxury of, here at my lab, being able to just manipulate all these different things to see which formats seem to be more effective than which formats. Most of my studies just involve short-term studies with usually with college students, so I, I don't know how far this work really transfers to the real world, but we do have a collection of principles for how to design multimedia um, instruction, both um, computer-based instruction or even games and simulations, and we're also getting interested in virtual reality, how, how you should design the instruction in those environments. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, so that has got to uh, keep you busy, right? Because since the change of, uh, you know, the explosion of mobile technology and then social media platforms, and then mm -hmm. VR now being accessible because of the computing power, right? Being right, right. Now you're going like, man, I'm going to, I got another 20 years. Of <laughs> exactly. But I don't think it's, I think we really want to understand how people learn the technology itself is like I said, it's not what is causing the learning. So yeah. I think it's the same, it's the same human mind that is learning, whether it's in VR or on a computer or reading a book. It's the same cognitive processes that have to be involved. So what we want to do is prime uh, the processes that I call selecting, organizing, and integrating. Those are kind of the main ideas in my theory that uh, we want to go we want instructional design that not just presents information, but also guides the learner's processing of the information. Because we can present things, but if people don't process them, it doesn't help. So we also want to guide the processing. And selecting means directing their attention to the important material. Right. Organizing means um, mentally putting that material together into some kind of coherent structure that makes sense to you. And then integrating means relating it to your relevant prior knowledge so that it further makes sense to you. So those are the kind of processes we want to encourage. So we want to design instruction that kind of minimizes extraneous, what I would call extraneous processing. So that's cognitive processing that does not, uh, is not related to the instructional objective. And we want all the cognitive processing to be directed towards attending to the relevant information, organizing it and integrating it. So, to me, that's the challenge of instructional design. People have a very limited working memory, but within that system, we want them to engage in all these processes. So people have to be efficient in the way they use their limited processing capacity. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes, absolutely. That makes sense, yes. So the, um, I noticed you mentioned a few things and I see that it kind of, it, it touches in other, in the works of all, other people as well, is that by 
by accident or happen to be because you know you guys build up uh, you know out of, off of each other right so like oh. swellers cognitive uh load and um merrill's i think merrill has integration in his pr principles yeah. is that the same you're basing it off or is it different i think they're all related i mean uh, um you know both uh, john sweller's work obviously is closely related to what i'm doing the idea of the idea of limited working memory capacity is probably the number one idea in cognitive science. That's probably the main, that's probably the number one main contribution of research in cognitive science right now. Yeah. Um, and we've known it since the, well, we've known it since the beginning. And William James talked about that in the 1800s, but, but we're understanding it a lot better, how working memory works and, and how limited we are in processing. So, John Sweller's work on um, cognitive load is, is is very similar to what I'm talking about. So we're really we really have very compatible theories, you know, overlapping theories in many ways. Yeah, and Dave Merrill, he, he kind of sees things even at a higher level. I mean, he has such a beautiful view of how learning and instruction works. So, he, and I feel the ideas of my theory are very consistent with the things he talks about too. Yeah, and you, uh, you, I, I have to say, um, I watched a couple of videos, read some some of your papers. I mean, you know, a couple, but you know, you you got over four hundred or so. How many? How many publications do you have? <laughs> yeah, it's probably over five hundred. You know, that's you know, another person we want to write a biography of. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what we do around here. We publish. <laughs> yeah. So let me let me see. Uh, <laughs> in 1978, you wrote. 20 papers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask you this then the, um, you have some principles in play. Tell us a little bit about, can you list them and kind of relate? Because I see, I mean, everything you mentioned there about these principles and, and, and the theory, it's so relevant to a learning design. And I, okay. and, and let me paint the picture because I want to make sure that you understand because I, you know, um, Two different worlds, right? So academia has got a, maybe a little bit of a learning that I see compared to what workplace learning does, which in workplace learning, there are this specific authoring tools. I mean, back in the day, you probably heard authorware and things like that. And mm -hmm. he, I'm, I'm pretty, maybe you're familiar with Michael Allen, uh, Dr. Michael Allen, whatnot. But uh, mm -hmm. now we have these tools. We have tools that are cloud-based. We have tools that are, you know, to be used a uh, client base they're using in your pc and your laptop and in the corporate world what happens is people like me and others uh use those tools to do two things use graphics use multimedia create courses and be able to uh, create assessments or tests and load that to a learning management system right so right. that's the that's the the workplace learning world however right. <laughs> there are a lot of perpetrators out there that are completely uh, maybe not aware of your principles or completely violating them. So right. can you please tell us about, uh, I know coherence, one of them, uh, temporal yeah. ambiguity, is it? Or is, is sure. It? Yeah, sounds good. So, um, yeah, I think you're right. Um, when you're designing instruction, you can, you can base it on your expert opinion. I mean... People who have been doing this for years and years have good intuitions about how to do it. So that's one approach. I do not, um, I, I don't really criticize people using their expert experience. I think that it's great to have that. But uh, what I try to contribute is kind of a scientific approach, an evidence-based approach, looking at, quote, what works. But I have to admit, it works in my lab. So I, that doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere. And, and, and it has to be adjusted to the situation you're going to use it in. But yeah, some of the principles we've come up with, we have about a dozen, maybe a few more now. The original one was what I would call the multimedia principle, which is that people learn better from words and graphics than from words alone. Okay. So it's really showing that there's a value added when you add graphics to a, multi, to a lesson that's mainly word-based, that helps people do better on a transfer test. So like we have lessons on how a car's braking system works or how a pump works or how um, th how lightning storms develop that are mostly word-based. But if we add graphics that kind of have frames that kind of correspond to what the text is talking about, yeah. that greatly enhances people's ability to answer questions that kind of go beyond the text. So that's kind of what got me started. 
multimedia principle, we know that adding graphics is helpful. But the problem is when you look at most instruction, if you look at textbooks or online instruction, a lot of the graphics are just kind of gratuitous. People add graphics just because they're cute or they found it on somewhere on the internet, but it, it doesn't really serve an instructional purpose. It's what I would call, sometimes it's what I would call decorational, right. um, or sometimes yeah. they're very low level, like what I would call representational, where they'll just show a picture of what they're talking about. But what we really want is um, graphics that really support deeper understanding, that organize the material or kind of show how it works. So like you mentioned, some, a few other principles are things like um, coherence. So the coherence principle is basically one that's already in the, I think, the folklore of instructional design. You know, keep it simple, stupid. So I call it um, coherence. You should eliminate extraneous material. So the lesson should not have a lot of bells and whistles that aren't needed. Doesn't, you don't need a lot of um, fancy um, things going on on the screen. It should just focus on what it is you want people to learn. Um, so we have found like adding um, interesting little details, what I would call seductive details to a lesson seductive. actually detracts from learning. Right. Um, adding cute little images or video clips that are really not relevant, but are just sort of interesting, that detracts from learning. Kind of, and you know, having backgrounds on your screen that's real fancy, that's distracting. The things that people do sometimes to make it more interesting really distract the learner. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's the coherence principle. Right. Um, and that's one of the principles aimed at what I would call reducing extraneous processing. Then we have some aimed at what I would call um, fostering our, um, well, I, I would say, um, <laughs> I'm trying to think which other ones I want to talk about. Um, I love how you smile when you talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of my babies. It's oh. like, yeah, <laughs> I understand, I understand. <laughs> uh, another principle, I'm just picking a few, is segmenting. So if you have like a complicated um, material you're trying to present, it's better to break it into smaller parts and show it part by part than to present it all at once. I mean, and that even applies to slides. I mean, if you have a, a PowerPoint slide that just has a lot of information on it, it's overwhelming to present that all at once. You should present it part by part and just add on to it as, as it's being discussed. Okay. Um, so that's the segmenting principle. And then, so um, I'll talk about one other one that's more, a little weirder, one I didn't really, believe at first it's more of a social based on social cues but the um, one idea is that if you use conversational language people learn better than if you use formal language okay. so if you're trying to explain something and everything's in third person and it's very formal people don't learn as well as if you use let's say um, first and second person you say I and we and you people people learn better if it's if it's presented more as a conversation than as a just I'm telling you this. Um, what about that's what about, the personalization uh, principle? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what about um, the um, animated pedagogical agents? Are you still done any work with that? Have that? Yeah, because I think that there's a lot to be done with animated pedagogical agents. I think um, you know we all were excited when they first kind of came on the scene, and they were. When was that? Um, oh. Well. You know, I think they really became popular about 20 years ago. I mean, okay. they were available before that, but um, only really skilled computer scientists could develop them, and they required a lot of computing power. But I think, you know, starting around 2000, I think we started to see a lot more work on, on pedagogical yeah. agents. Uh, and now there are, yeah, there are toolboxes where you can use, yes. you can use authoring tools with them, and they, and they look good. I mean, they're, they're reasonable. So we really want to know how can we use them? Do people respond to agents the same way they respond to humans? I think there's a lot of evidence that they do, that they'll, they'll accept a kind of cartoon-like character the same way they would a human. Um, so what so would be, interesting question there. What would be more effective, something that is illustrated or something that's photographic? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think if we're going to use, um, you know, um, virtual agents, don't want them too photorealistic. I think they become a little creepy. Mm. Um, you know they're not human, but they just kind of look human. Unless you can get it really perfect, probably don't want it too photorealistic. <laughs> but I mean, if you're doing videos of real humans, I don't, I don't think that's going to be any different than probably using an animated pedagogical agent. I think that they would both have similar effects. What we've found in our research is it's voice that carries a lot of the social cues. So it might be good to have a real human voice, even if you have pedagogical agents, rather than a machine voice. I mean, I have a lot of colleagues who tell me machine voices today are perfect. You can't even tell they're machines. That would be good if you can't tell. But if you can tell that it's a machine voice, I think that detracts from the lesson. So it would be better to have sound files of, with human voice. Yeah, so, so no text-to-speech is what you're saying. Yeah, no text-to-speech. Uh, now, I know I that um, uh, Amazon has done some good work on that uh, with something called Polly, which apparently many of the voices seem to be a really good quality, but... It might uh, work. How about Alexa? Does that work? Or Alexa's too robotic? Yeah, no. She's great. She's funny. <laughs> Just the funniest things. So I, I do think the technology is improving and it's there might, probably, it'll get there sometime. <laughs> it might be there now. I mean, I just haven't, um, I haven't seen it in our work yet, but I have seen other studies where people have, people have kind of replicated our work with today's um, um, text-to-speech okay. um, applications, and they get, the, they get the, the machine to be just as good as a human. So I think that's definitely possible. <laughs> Oh, okay. So you, um, I'm, I'm interested in something, and I apologize because I'm not, you know, <laughs> anywhere close to a statistician in any way, but <laughs> I hear you mention a lot. Um, I know you did some great studies, and you mentioned things like, you know, 16 out of 16 people did this, and 23 out of whatever. Now, you, you always mention with point whatever effect. Uh -huh. uh, what does that mean? So I think, you know, um, Effect size is kind of the metric I would use in any kind of intervention research. In any kind of instructional intervention research, you know, we're used in psychology to looking at significance level. We want it, hey, we got a significant effect at 0.05. I mean, that's great, but if you're really interested in the practical value of what you're doing, effect size is, I think, a much better metric because effect size really tells you how powerful your instructional effect is. So it's really telling you, if you have an effect size of 0.5, it's telling you the treatment group scored a half a standard deviation better than the control group. So it gives you kind of a common metric to compare all the studies. Um, you're looking at how many standard deviations better did the treatment group do than the control group. And I think if you can get an effect size of 0.4, which means your, your instruction improved performance by 0.4 standard deviations, that to me is a really, that shows you have an educationally important instructional technique you're using. Mm, okay. um, so I always try to look for effects that are at least 0.4 because that's enough to improve somebody's, you know, if it's in school, it's enough to increase your grade by a level or two. And if it's more looking at performance, it's enough to increase your performance um, so that it's noticeable. So I'm not as worried about significance as I am effect size. Okay. I'm looking for effect sizes that are at least point, point 0.4. So it all, works. Yeah, all right. it is is you take the mean of the experimental group, the mean of the control group, and subtract them and divide by the standard deviation. Oh, okay. okay. So it's just telling you, hey, your, your group did so many standard deviations better than the control group. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. So you uh, mentioned... And something I wanted to ask you was that there, um, let me recall here what I'm thinking. Uh, so we were talking about virtual reality, right? And I right. do see, at least from my experience, because I, I own a, a VR system, Oculus Rift. Um, uh -huh. I do see that the, there are some differences in there that need to be studied in terms of maybe the, the principles that you have and, and how do they apply because of the whole immersion 
process, right? And the, right. And the 360 sensory stuff, right? Uh, right? Do you do any work that involves sensory perception? Yep. Size, yep. Eyes, ears? Well, we... Tactile? We haven't done tactile yet. We've just used been using immersive virtual reality. We use the HTC Vive in our research, but it's very similar to the Oculus Rift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So They're what did you just, find so far? Um, you know, it's really interesting since we're not, we're not really developers, we have to use off the shelf um, programs. So we've used some off the shelf programs and we've found that actually people learn better from a PowerPoint presentation than from learning an IPR. So that's kind of depressing if you really love virtual reality and you think it's so great. And then when we look more closely, we find that what's going on is in, in virtual reality, when people are walking around with that head mounted display on, they're distracted. There's just a lot going on. Like in one study, we used a program called the Body VR. You take a trip through the bloodstream and you learn all about the cells that are in the bloodstream. And it's perceptually very rich. There's just a lot going on that's, that's extraneous. There's just lots of colors and things moving by. But you're supposed to be learning about this one specific cell. But there's too much going on, I think. So I think you're, dis you're distracted. And we know because working memory is limited, if you're looking at all this other stuff, you're not really focusing in on what the lesson wants you to focus in on. But if we take that same material and just put it in a PowerPoint presentation, it's boring, but people learn better. So what we tried to do then is to see what can we do to help people learn better in VR. And what we did was to kind of stop the lesson at five different places and have people summarize what they've learned so far. So that's kind of a generative learning strategy is, is summarizing. That greatly helps people's learning in VR because they think people are not reflecting on what they're learning. They're just so overwhelmed by the perceptual experience, they're not really thinking deeply. So mm. by stopping it every once in a while and just saying, okay, tell me what you've learned so far, that really helps them kind of focus on what they've learned so far. Yeah, yeah the reflection, okay. Yeah, that, that summarizing helps them reflect and they do much better on our transfer tests. So I think um, VR has a lot of potential because it allows you to go places you couldn't normally go and do things that you normally couldn't do, things that might be too dangerous or too expensive or, yeah. or just not feasible, you can do in VR. And I think there are a lot of great instructional applications, just things like we did one with um, safety training in the lab from this um, company called Labster. They're wonderful. They have wonderful um, lessons. Um, that's something you would need a real lab to train people in. So you can go to a virtual lab and learn how to do this stuff. Um, so it's a lot less expensive or, and it's some places it wouldn't be feasible at all. So I think there's a lot of potential, but we just need a lot more research on exactly how to make sure people are um, paying attention and processing the material and not just overwhelmed by how cool it is. Mm, I see. That might, that might change once people get more experience because all of the subjects in our studies, for all of them, it was the first time they were in VR. So just getting used to it might take some time, but I think as time goes by and people get more experience with it, um, that novelty effect might go away and it might become then a better instructional platform. Wow, okay. So I should definitely have our names below us, right? <laughs> yeah, that'd probably be good. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a good multimedia joke for you. So, yeah. And so just awesome. arrows pointing like mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So um, in the, so what, the one thing I wanted to ask you then, because I see many uh, similarities there with, it seems like in the workplace learning, a lot of people come more from, or many of the people that, that I see, what they're picking on, obviously is what they pick out in conferences and whatnot. And most of what is spoke about, it's not so much your theories, but, or your work, or even your experimental work, but the um, graphic design type of knowledge and graphic design, yeah. uh, say, uh, I think uh, even they call them principles or, yeah, yeah, I think they call them principles in some respects. Sure. Uh, so, you know, that, and they, very similar to what you're talking about. So it's funny because I don't know where graphic design is pulling the science from, <laughs> right? But Well, <laughs> I think they're pulling, 
I, I agree with you. A lot of the um, kind of traditional um, graphic design principles, I, I think a lot of them are consistent with our evidence-based principles. And, and that, to me, makes sense because I think it, if you have a lot of experience, you kind of can see what works and what doesn't work. And just based on your practical knowledge, you kind of see that. Okay. Yeah. Evaluate we try to do is to just look at it in a scientific way, do controlled experiments comparing this group to that group to see who learns better. If you add this feature, do they learn better or not? That allows us to kind of validate the principles. And some of them maybe do conflict with conventional wisdom. Like I think one, one principle that you kind of alluded to before is um, spatial, what I call spatial contiguity, kind of a weird yeah, yeah. term. But this, normally when you have, a, and let's say in a book, you have a graphic and then below it you have a caption that explains it. That's kind of the conventional way to do it. That's the way graphic designers would probably be taught to do it. But our research shows it's better to take those words and put them into the graphic itself next to the part of the graphic that it's explaining. Okay. So if it's, if it's explaining, let's say, um, mm, how a car's braking system works, we could have the explanation as a caption, or we could just take it and put it next to each part. Like it would say, when the driver steps on the brake pedal, that would be next to the brake pedal. A piston moves forward in the master cylinder, that would be next to the master cylinder, <laughs> um, and, and so on. Each thing you're talking about, you put those words next to that part of the graphic. That greatly enhances people's understanding and allows them to make a connection between the words and the graphics. Because when the words are underneath as a caption, you have to keep looking back and forth because our eyes can only look at one place at a time. And if you're scanning back and forth, trying to figure out what, when it says piston, then you have to look back to see what's a piston. You're, you're wasting a lot of your resources. So yeah, that's what you, uh, I think you have explained before that you have to have pre-training on it, right? Yeah, pre-training helps. So yeah, it's, it's all very interesting how there are so many similarities, but you necessarily, did not go and pursue, you know, graphic design principles and, and study that. No, I just tried to look at if you're going to add graphics, what would be the best way to do it? So I tried to dissect it a little piece by piece. Should, you know, all the different ways you could do it. Let's, let's see which ones work better based on, you know, a theory of how people learn. Awesome. <laughs> now, Last question, and you know, we're off the cuff, so that's why I'm, I, it just came to my mind that you were talking about these things, and then when I listened to the videos, it seems that there's a commonality there, but obviously it's because you're doing a, you're doing a metric, so I mean, a measurement of what, what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. It all seems to be to be test-based, right? Right. So learning meaning transfer knowledge for, on a, but you're, your measuring stick is a test. Right. Um, yeah. How does that, is that something where you uh, waited uh, some time, you know, a space of time and then came back and did the same test? Or mm -hmm. how, how did that work? Because I'm concerned in the thing that, you know, I think where you, tr you understand what I'm trying to get at is like, definitely I'm for a test right now, <laughs> you know, and I cram. <laughs> That's a, that's a great question because I think that's a really good criticism of most of our work and my colleagues' work. If you oh, just <laughs> have a short lesson and then we give you a test and you do well on the test, that's great. But is that really going to last? That's kind of what you want to know. Yeah, so yeah. we have done, most of our tests are immediate, but we have done some delayed tests. And our delayed tests, okay, our idea of a delay might be one or two weeks. So it's not a huge delay, but it's better than nothing. Right. And what happens is, in most of our studies, the effects get stronger after a delay. That's true of a lot of research on um, instructional techniques that are supposed to foster understanding. They actually get stronger um, because I think it's easier to forget things. If you didn't understand it in the first place, it's, it's easier to forget it. But if you did understand it, it lasts longer. So, But I do agree with you. We need delay tests, and we need um, maybe more performance-based tests. For, you know, for teaching people, they should be able to now do something with it. So um, performance tests would be a good way to go also. So yeah, I think we've got 
a ways a ways to go on the dependent measure side of things. Mm. That's when you're doing. I, I find when you're doing research, the hardest part is figuring out how to measure what people know. The kind of the measurement of people's knowledge is a lot harder than just designing the instruction. I know how to like design instruction and compare it this to that, but then how to measure how well people understand it. That is challenging. And I agree with you. A delayed test is better than an immediate test. And probably some more kind of a performance a measure is probably we need as, as well as just the kind of write an answer kind of test. Mm, okay, that's interesting. Well, thank you for that. That's a great answer. Uh, mm -hmm. All right, sir, if we look at all things, all great things come to an end. And obviously, this okay. is another one of those. Uh, okay. I just want to ask you, what are your last thoughts? What do you recommend uh, for folks that just, you know, we got a lot of folks that just uh, become instructional designers, not really with the opportunities to go to a, an academic program. It happens in work a lot where mm -hmm. the title is used, but um, it's just because folks have demonstrated some kind of graphic ability, you know, to work with PowerPoint or work with video or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you recommend in terms, I mean, I can always say go to the, I think you have like a chapter in the Cambridge book and. Uh, I would, I would say this. <laughs> you got that book, yes, that book as well. <laughs> in learning, yes, in learning of the science of instruction. Sweet. Yeah. I think, I think that is a good place to go. And it kind of, the genesis of this book is kind of like our interview because Ruth Clark is very interested in taking scientific research and making it available to instructional designers. I mean, that's her job. She goes around and does workshops on this all over the country. Right, right. And I remember I met her once at a conference and she said to me something like, Rich, you do a lot of great work, but wouldn't you like people to actually use it? <laughs> so the whole purpose of this book was to try and translate what we know into a form that practitioners might um, be willing to take a look at. Nice. Okay, guys, check the links in the description for that. Um, you know, sir, I really appreciate you taking the time being here with me off the cuff. It's, it has been completely an honor to have this conversation with you, and I'm pretty sure our viewers are going to uh, love it as well. Um, I'd like to wish you the best, uh, and thank you so much for, for uh, being here. And um, not much I can say. I mean, I'm still giddy about this. This is, this is a great experience for me. <laughs> well, thank you, and I want to thank you for what you're doing, because I think – it is so important to try and um, build these bridges between the research, people who do the research and people who actually do the practice part of it. Um, I think if we can have more communication, that's gonna really help both of us. <laughs> that's yeah. great. Well guys, so there it is, another epic episode of ATDC Files Off The Cuff. We'll see you on the next one.